Today I want to talk about the relationship between landscape and the human population and I want to share some of my observations about the carrying capacity of land or in other words the number of people that an area of land can support whilst maintaining a healthy natural balance. Now, when we started here we bought land that was previously part of a much bigger farming estate land was being used to graze sheep and once a year the lambs were rounded up and sold at market. We bought the land as a cooperative and then subdivided it into plots to create an eco-village. So this land, which previously formed a small part of one farmer's portfolio, now supports an entire community, approximately 50 people. What was once sheep fields has become a diverse mosaic of habitats and ecosystems, home to a vast array of wildlife, and interspersed within that is a whole neighbourhood of people. And so, what is it that makes our approach to living on the land different from the mainstream? One of the key differences is in how we approach meeting our needs. As human beings, we need food, water, energy, shelter. Now in the mainstream, people earn money to buy these provisions. But here, we aim to meet as many of our needs as we can directly from the land. You see, if you have access to land, it is entirely possible with the right infrastructure to grow your own food, grow your own fuel, harvest your own energy and source your own water. Here we have created vegetable gardens, orchards, forest gardens and sheltered growing spaces. We also keep a range of livestock and between these systems we're able to harvest fresh produce year round and we're able to store food for the leaner months. We have planted coppice and woodland as fuel crops and we harvest the sun's energy to make electricity. We have spring water on tap and we harvest and collect rainwater for irrigation. Now it takes a while to design and set up these infrastructure systems but once they're in place they take very little money to run. Instead they take a lot of labour but for us it's a labour of love. For example we keep goats and we milk by hand and this supplies us with a regular supply of fresh raw milk. It's a lot of work but I'd rather do this than buy pasteurised milk from a shop. And the thing about raw milk is that it's full of probiotics, a bit like a super healthy natural yoghurt drink. But it doesn't have a long shelf life, you have to drink it fresh and that's why you'll never see it in the shops. It literally is something that money can't buy. Another key difference is in how we relate to the natural world. Conventionally, a farmer grows a crop, harvests it and then sells it for money. And often that represents a massive nutrient loss for the land base. And this then leads to a depleted ecosystem. Here we see ourselves as part of the ecology and we want to live in an abundant ecosystem. And so we build systems that accumulate and store nutrients. And the best way to do this is by creating complex, multi-dimensional ecosystems. And if you're a grower, you'll know that it all starts with the soil. And so that's why we have composting toilets, and reed beds, compost heaps, composting chambers. That's why we create wood chips 
biochar, mulch. It's also a large part of why we keep animals for their manure. And you'll notice that all these systems are human scale. That's because we choose to live and work in direct contact with nature, in relationship with the plants and the animals. For us, living this lifestyle is a deeply personal choice. It enables us to connect with our own nature, inner and outer. And the thing is, when you live this way of life, your value system changes. Wealth becomes about quality of life rather than financial affluence. And the more you move away from the economic system, the less it makes sense. And so whilst we do have cash crops and income from land-based crafts and from growing seeds, the financial gains from these activities don't really reflect their true value to us. And we do them as much out of a sense of community service than as an income stream. You see, most of our day-to-day -day needs are met directly from the land. And whilst this is incredibly nourishing and fulfilling, it does take up a lot of time and energy. And at the same time, we do need funds to buy tools and materials so that we can continue investing in our infrastructure. And so rather than create large-scale food production systems to supply a market already saturated with cheap subsidised industrially produced food. Generally, we reserve our homegrown food for ourselves and for our local community and generate additional income with part-time work, doing something else that we love and something that has a higher value in the mainstream. In our case, I help design homesteads and my partner Hoppy teaches the healing arts. This is one of the ways in which we bridge the gap between building a sustainable future in the context of an unsustainable world. On one level is about trust. We choose to invest in a diverse and productive landscape rather than pension funds. Another way of looking at it is like this. A compost heap is worth more to us the money in the bank. And so our approach leads to a pattern of development that is very different to that which you will see in the mainstream. We are creating diverse and abundant systems that support us to deepen our connection to the natural world. We believe that human scale micro solutions can offer us a better quality of life than industrial scale macro solutions. Conventionally, food is grown in the countryside and then transported to people in towns and the waste from the towns is taken away for processing. Similarly, water is collected in the hills and piped towns and energy is generated elsewhere and then cabled to the people. This is the town and countryside model that our society is based on. All these roads and distribution networks take a huge amount of energy and resources to run. On one level, what we're doing is cutting out those industrial production and transportation systems by redistributing the people into the countryside, into the landscape where they can harvest their own resources in a way that is human scale, nature friendly and good for the soil. And that is how we've managed to increase the carrying capacity of the land. And the thing is, as each year goes by, we're constantly building fertility 
developing our infrastructure and deepening our understanding such that the potential carrying capacity of the land keeps on growing. And it seems to me that we're only just beginning to explore the potential of this landscape to become a Garden of Eden. There are different ways of doing things. They are totally possible, they are readily available, and for many of us, they offer us a glimpse into a better world.